If you have your Bibles, you can turn in them. Uh, we've been doing a passage, or should I say a, a thought concept, or a series uh, in Matthew, and uh, Matthew chapter 22. And today, uh, as we look into the Word, we're going to find a man who came to Jesus perhaps with the wrong motives, and yet Jesus took the time to not just answer him, but really to lay down some very important, uh, some important teaching for us. In Matthew chapter 22, it, it says that there was this uh, man who came to Jesus and uh, he was, the scripture earlier says he was, I think verse 25 says, he wanted to tempt Jesus and really what he was doing was, it was, it was a setup. The religious leaders wanted to get rid of Jesus under any pretext, but they had to figure out how to do it. So they set this young man up and said, we want you to go out and try to trick him you're our, you're our best hope. You're the sharpest knife in the drawer we've got. We want you to go out and ask him some questions and try to get him to falter so that we can say, oh, he's wrong. There's no truth in him. And Jesus answers him so skillfully uh, that the man, is, he, he doesn't have an answer. Now, you know, there are some people that are just to say, too big for their britches. You know, can God make a rock so big he can't move it? That's such nonsense. People have rehearsed certain things like that because they think it's cute or they think they've got things figured out and they really just show their ignorance. So this guy comes to Jesus trying to trick Jesus and Jesus takes an opportunity to teach a important truth that we need to know. Matthew chapter 22 at verse 37, this is Jesus answered. Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. It's all contained here at the very seminal part right here. Today, we are going to look about learning to love like Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to have to learn to love like Jesus loves. Someone said to me, I'm having a hard time forgiving. And I said, I, how, many, how many have a hard time forgiving? Someone does you wrong. It, how many would be honest and say it hurts? I mean, we didn't sign up for the abuse. If we're going to love like Jesus loves, we're going to have to ask him to help us to learn to forgive. Now, I get afraid because, you know, hey, I'm going to be a doormat. What are they going to, they're going to abuse me. I, I, I don't want to be, quote, punished. I don't want to go through the hard stuff. But I see what Jesus went through, and I said, you know, if he'll help me, I've got to change. And I have to learn to love like Jesus loves. I, I, I'm still in the process. Every once in a while, a bad attitude comes out, you know? I, I'm not sure if you're like me, but I would guess that sometimes you say, I can't believe I even thought that. Well, they did, got what they deserved. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, help me not get that. Because I didn't deserve what I got. I got forgiven. I received forgiveness. Let's just bow our heads for prayer. Lord, as we look into your word, we're asking, we're asking you to help us to change our attitude and our actions about loving people, not because they deserve it, but because you want to love through us. And I pray today that you would help us as we apply your word and teach us your ways, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are a follower of the Lord, you are going to learn to love God and learn love other people. Followers of Jesus love God and love others. 
Now, there are people that are unlovely. There are some that have a face that only a mother could... No, I'm just, just kidding. There are some people that are like porcupines. Wherever you touch them, you're going to get hurt. Okay? You know how you kiss a snake? Very carefully. <laughs> you ever see that picture of that guy kissing a snake, Cobra on the head? And I'm saying to myself, why would you want to do that? You are nuts. Sometimes there are people... Well, let me put, give you another statement. Hurt people hurt people. We live in a world of ouchy people, and when you get close to them, <laughs> they get you. You ever get hit with the 220, and you're going like, man, how did that happen? <laughs> I, I didn't do a thing wrong. <laughs> you know, they're into you like that. And you come away, and you, your adrenaline is gone, and you say, I just pushed my shopping cart. I didn't realize I cut them off. It's not a federal case. You know, feel free to take your 500 items in in front of me. You know, but they were in a hurry and you were in my way. I hope it wasn't any of you that was in, the, you know. <laughs> we live in a world that says what is in it for me. And here we are, aliens. Look, point your name and say, you are an alien. <laughs> you don't belong here. Because we are motivated totally different. The inside nature of God is at work in us. And we are, hey, here's the problem. When I got saved, I didn't always think godly thoughts. I had some bad stinking thinking. I had some habits that were inconsistent with the kingdom of God. And as I walk with the Lord, he confronts those bad habits, and sometimes I like the bad habits. And the Holy Spirit said, but you hold on to them, it's going to hurt you. You know how it is? How many of you have ever been shocked by an electric fence? How many like that? How many actually had your hand on it like this when it shocked? And what happened? Your hand went, you're going like, I can't let go. Yeah. Sometimes the bad habit, it's hard to let go because it torques us so bad. And you're praying, I pray that someone turns off the juice because my my muscles are contracting around it. And you, you, it's one of those things, the whole longer you hurt, the worse you get. It ain't no fun. If you've not had that thrill of that experience, pass. Okay? Been there, done that. <laughs> okay. Just thought. We learn that our love is anchored in a commitment. That's point number one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. It is a command to do that. This comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Hebrew word that's in there. Everyone say Ahib. Good, you're Hebrew now. That's close enough. Actually, it's Ahib. They sort of get a to it. Ahib. And it talks about love by choice. Now, I'm going to just say something to all the... Any daters here? We have the newlyweds over here. They're sitting over this section. So it's a little warmer in that corner. I don't know why. But you, you love with emotion. Okay? Do you get what I call the warm blue fuzzies? But you also love with commitment. Because there's going to come a day when that person is going to, you're going to be someplace and they go, honey, I love you. And the paint on the wall goes, you know, bad breath, hair going this way. And, you know, it's just, you, 
and, and you realize this is a love of commitment. It, I'm not feeling a warm, warm fuzzy here. <laughs> but I, I, boy, I committed to this. <laughs> That's what my wife says. Oh, Lord, I committed to this. <laughs> I'm talking about what I look. The other day, my wife says to me, honey, apparently the way my, I got up, my hair was like, she goes, I think you should start spiking your hair. <laughs> True? Some was like, she goes, you look good with a mohawk, you know. <laughs> I'm not so sure I'm signing up for that, you know. But anyhow, uh, you love because you're committed. The guy that married us says, it is love that has brought you to this place of commitment, but now it's going to be the commitment that you have that's going to sustain your love. Some people only love with emotion, and then they lose when it comes to commitment. And they're like in and out of the door in a heartbeat. And you're going like, man, how'd that happen? Love is exhibited by your will, your mind, and your actions. Instead, that's what it talks about. Love the Lord your God. It's not always about your feelings and your emotions. There are some times when you love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your soul and your mind. And you don't like what you're going through. It's not God, is, you know, he's, he saves us. Well, Sister Marie played that song. Thank you. She didn't know she was going to be in the sermon. Some through the water, some through the fire, some through the flood, all through the blood. She, she was letting us know that there are some difficulties that may come our way. And loving is not just an, a, an emotion. It's a commitment that we make to God. As I was uh, telling us. Sunday school class a, a moment about Joseph. Potiphar's wife comes in and, and uh, makes a pass at him. And he says, he leaves, he runs and he says, I, I could not sin against my God. That relationship he had with God was a commitment, not just an emotion. The passion of the moment called for something totally different. But his commitment to the Lord kept him on the straight and narrow it's a kind of, kind of highest love. It, it motivates you to do what is right and noble no matter what you might be feeling. When you talk about grit. It's a kind, in Greek we have the word agape. It's God's love with no reciprocation. It's it just God loves us. Because he loves us. That's it. And, and uh, so uh, it's a love of intelligence. Uh, phileo, we get Philadelphia, that's a love of brotherly love. Philadelphia, it's a love of emotion. Eros is a physical kind of attraction, okay? The love Jesus speaks of the, in the greatest commandment is the noblest, it's the purest, it's the highest form of self-sacrificing love that each person is commanded to have toward God. The Jewish people already knew their number one command was to love God with their whole heart and soul and mind and strength and all that. They already knew that. But what they wanted to do was try to trick Jesus and Jesus brought them back to the very essence. What he was really saying is you need God in your entire being. And that's, uh, so there are a couple different things here. I talked about heart love. And I put it down here, intelligent love. A heart love, in this case, it is the heart, it's at the core of your being. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. That was the whole premise of our Sunday school thing. Out of it, the heart, the issues of life, out of who you are, it determines what you do. Out of it are the issues of life. So keep your heart pure. Because everything you do, you want to be pure. Every, you know, uh, it, it comes from the heart. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, right? Heart is the intellect in this case. It's the very heart of the core of the being. It produces what our thoughts are, our words and our actions. You cannot tell me, whoops, I wasn't thinking I did the wrong thing. That's not true because you had to think it before you could do it. Amen, Pastor. That's right preaching. Because our world says, whoops, I did it again. Britney Spears for the older group. Whoops, I was stupid. Whoops, 
Yeah, you were. But you knew what you were doing. See, there's, we don't want to be responsible. Everybody passes the buck. Except in the offering. <laughs> Get that? <laughs> then they just take your buck. <laughs> That's called taxes. Heart is so important because everything else is determined by what we really are inside at the core of our being. Later on it says, as a man thinketh, so is he. You know what, I want to have my, I need my thinking clean, don't you? When I got saved, I was not, I mean, the best thinking I had was, I need, I need the Lord. And he's in the process of changing my thinking. In the process, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm hopefully thinking more like Jesus now, more than ever before. But I, he's still, there's still some attitudes and some things that I am learning. And, and I want to have that shaped by the word of God. He cleanses, he washes, he renews my mind by the word of God. That's why I read. And so... We, we, in, in we're going here. The, the second kind of love is soul kind of love, emotional love. Matthew seems to have the word soul to refer to our emotions. Jesus says uh, later on in Matthew, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. In, in Matthew chapter 26, he's talking about going to the cross. Here, emotionally, part of me doesn't want to die. Hey, could you relate to that? His humanity, he didn't want to die. But intellectually, his heart, his mind, his will said, I must die. It's important. It, because if it, I don't. So we have a, a soul, emotional love. We have intelligent love, which is guiding everything else. We have emotional love, which can be fickle. She loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, she loves, you know. And we're letting a flower determine that. Come on. Wait a minute. Shall I ask Mary? Out? Heads? No. It's tails. Nope. Okay. I'm going to let a quarter determine my behavior? Emotional. If my wife found out about Mary, I'm dead. <laughs> She's here. There's my, the mind kind of love. Okay, we're going to... Love God with all our heart and our soul and our mind. The Lord replaced the word might in Deuteronomy 6, 5, because that's where the Shema is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Thou shalt, and that's where it comes from. And that's Shema is the first word of that Hebrew uh, passage. Here, listen. In, in Spanish it says scuchen. It mean, has to do with the hearing. Hear, O Israel, pay attention. The Lord our God is one. And then he goes on. He replaces that word might in Deuteronomy 6, 5 with the word mind. And it wasn't a misquotation on the Lord's part, but the word might is a, a, a wider intention. It has to do with the will of an individual. It, it, removes, uh, it, it refers to moving ahead with energy. The word mind uh, can be used in the same way it, it, in one sense. To love the Lord with all of your mind means that you are determining that you're going to go forward. There are some times that we don't love God with all our mind because we don't want to take a step forward because we're afraid. Or we're concerned about the ramifications and the consequences. And he says, but if you are going to be my people, you're going to have to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your might or your mind. See, there's no other joy than to do what God asks us to do. This is not a, like a, an option. It's not like we had the ten options. Uh, this, they were commandments. Well, this is a command. Number four has to do with loving the Lord with all of our strengths. And this is, well, to, just let me say to you, tomorrow is food bank. And there will be a lot of people serving the Lord with their strengths. They tote this barge and lift this bale or something like that. Some people are, are carrying boxes and we have people who just wheel the stuff outside and other people that are handing a can at a time. 
whether you know it or not, we are going to move in less than two hours between four and five tons of food. Real, I mean, one family at a time. Divide that by 200 families or so. That's a lot of food. But it's not all lifted at one time. Uh, this is what we can do physically. I love the Lord in my mind, but I don't want to do anything for him. That is an inconsistency in our wiring makeup. It doesn't even sound right when I said it, did it? And but there are people that say, I love God, but I don't want to get involved. Wait a minute. If I'm going to serve the Lord with my strength, I don't have an, really an option to be anything but involved. Involvement goes with the loving. If I'm going to love my neighbor as myself, teenagers, close your ears. Well, I read a statistic that 50% of the teenagers' life is in the mirror. <laughs> Yes, you handsome buzzard. Uh, so which of these is most important? Intellectual love, emotional love, willing love, or serving love? How many will vote for one? How many vote for number two? How many vote for number three? How many vote for number four? How many are saying the whole enchilada? See, the good balance is that when we're doing all of those things, but it's got to have the right motivation inside. Because you can do any one of those things and your heart's not in it. But if we have the right motivation inside, if we're learning to love like Jesus loves, we are going to have to have his... You're going to have to have a heart transplant. You're going to have to make a new love connection. And then these things will flow out of the abundance of the who we are. All these things are important, and we are commanded to love God in all of these areas. And uh, we can't love God or love others until we first receive the love of the Lord in our hearts. See, if that's not there, we can do bits and pieces here, and we're a nice person. But it has no spiritual application. But when... God is involved and he works in our heart. He is the foundation for everything that's going on. And, and that's how we can love other people. That's where God, and why can't I say it like this, he takes away the risk of, of forgiving. Because if I choose to not forgive, then I have to keep a record. Wasn't it 1 Corinthians 13 that says, Love keeps no record of wrongs done. I've got to have a love reorientation here. Because when I forgive someone, I release them from their obligation to me. That lightens me up for the, ro the road. I don't have to carry that. I can't talk to John because he didn't forgive me. I can't do this because they're a weasel. Oh, did that come out? Sometimes we have this little list of what we can and can't do, and God says, I'll take care of that. Vengeance is mine. You know what? I'm working in John, too. I'm working in this other person, too, and I want to forgive them. Can you, do you think you're getting the same page with me so we can forgive them together? When I do that, I have a release. I and filled to a greater capacity. When I'm learning to love and forgive like Jesus did, it's a freeing thing. I don't worry about, am I going to look stupid or not? Let me just say it like this. You owe the bank $100,000, and they said, Reverend Ketterman, we're calling you on the phone just to say we'd like to forgive that bank. That whole, I mean, here's the bank, we're going to forgive that loan. You owe us nothing. After you spatula me off the floor, I say, man, I like that bank. 
man, did they do me the right thing. I would have never, I wonder how they're making it. I'm concerned for them, <laughs> you know what I mean? They forgave me $100,000, can you believe it? When you and I give forgiveness to someone else, it doesn't make us look bad or stupid. It makes us look Christ-like. It frees me up to do a better job. Learning to love. Number two, we need to learn that our love needs to connect to something. We need to, our, our love has to take it. It has to be commitment that connects. Uh, the, I had a hard time writing this down. We learn that our love needs to connect that commitment of Christ to other people. It's not love until it's fleshed out. Uh, I wrote a thought to myself, make my self-seeking the measure of my self-serving. You're to love your neighbor as, a, as yourself. So if I'm giving myself the benefit of the doubt, why can't I give the benefit of the doubt to someone else? Let me put it to you another way. The scripture says, preferring our brethren. It goes a step beyond and says, you know what? I think so much about you that I am giving you the benefit of the doubt that you really meant the right thing. You know what? If you start, and I start like that. I, I was in a situation not too long ago, very hostile environment, not around here. None of you are involved. And someone said, well, what about that? And I said, well, I don't know. The man wouldn't know if he bit me on the nose. But could it be, and I framed it in such a way to, to make the man really sound well, and someone came up to me and said, that's exactly what it was all about later on. They knew the man. They said, thank you for knowing him. I didn't know him. I just preferred to expect and believe the very best of them. And you know what? That was the truth. Someone says, man, you defended him. I don't know. But God did. And God's keeping track of that guy too. We have to commit this, put this together. This word as is very radical. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now that's provided. There's a proviso here. Provided you like yourself. I take nothing for granted. Some people don't like themselves. They put themselves down. Now, someone did come to me one time. I have a self-deprecating humor. I make fun of me rather than make fun of you. Okay, sometimes I say, hey, what's about me? Someone came and says, you know, Pastor, we're really worried about your self-esteem. Don't worry, plenty of ego for to fill the room. It's, I don't feel bad about myself. I just prefer to do that rather than make you look bad. I'll do it because I've, I've got a tough hide. It was funny. I, I served at a church. I worked with the children. You know, you had to be careful what people think of you, but sometimes it doesn't matter. And I worked with kids, and the one parent came to me and said, are you ever serious? And I said, well, there are times when it just kicks in, but very few times. You know, how many want your kid to go to someone who goes, okay, now let's all turn to the book of Lamentations for our study tonight. And the kids are going like, mm. you know, they're out of there. In the same week, I was doing communion at the, at the, at the okay, doing the communion is not a time to be telling jokes and a little soft shoe and dance and all that. I was serving the elements of communion and the one lady said to a dear friend of mine, that man is so serious. Do you think he ever has fun? And, and, and my friend started to laugh. He says, he's fine, he's fine. Sometimes people see you at one little spot and they make a whole assumption about who you are. And it's, some, and it's wrong. How do you know that we're not all one thing? How do you know that most of us need to lighten up a little bit? I don't take life too seriously to some I take the Lord very seriously. I take his word seriously. Eh, there's some stuff, eh, you know what. 
when it's all said and done, that's probably much it. There are some people who plan out their every Saturday. I was disappointed and I was actually thinking of sending some hate mail to a particular television station yesterday because I wanted to watch the Penn State football game. And every time I click on, no signal. And I was blessing them. And I thought to myself early on, I'll think the best. They'll have it on by 3.30. They'll have it at 3.35, no, no signal. <sighs> you know what? I got a little tech, a, a testy. My wife wouldn't stay in the same room. <laughs> Good news is Penn State won, if, and they won without me. <laughs> How the nerve of them. You know, sometimes we get too wired about some stuff. Not all that important in the grand scheme of life. There are some people who plan, and if you're like this, please just stay with me. I went camping and there was a lady in our camping group and she had everything planned. Every meal on that camping trip. If we had a campfire, she would say to her family, you may have one hamburger. Not two, one. You know, you can have 6.3 Doritos. After that, you're... She had limited space. And so she had planned. And I'm thinking, how can you enjoy life when you've got it down to... I always felt bad for them. You know, we'd just give them extra food, you know, just, just to defy the lady. How many know this is not in the notes? But she planned for her happiness. There are some people who micromanage everything about themselves. And so they want to have everything in plan and someone else comes along and they don't give them the same kind of time. They don't put the same, if people, I talked to a man one time and I said, if you would just spend as much time in the relationship with your wife, you would have a happy marriage as you do on whatever he was doing. And he looked at me, I, don't, I, I would almost say what he was doing, and it was not terrible, but in his sport. And he said, we're growing apart. I said, if you would just spend as much time on your relationship, you would have a happy marriage. You want to be a happy person, love God with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's a balance here. It's a balance here. We put our, our, into our lives, if, if we invest in other people, and that's what I call it, when you die and go to heaven, I pray you do, when you get there, God is not going to say, what do you have? He's going to ask you, who did you bring? Who did you influence? Who did you help? See, I serve with a purpose. I strategically serve. I can't be everywhere all the time at all, every place. And so I say, Lord, help me to be at the right place. And it's not the most bang for the buck because sometimes it's just one person as opposed to a crowd. But if I know I've been obedient to the Lord, he's going to say, well done. Philip is having a, a major wide revival and God says, I've got some guy I want you to talk to. And Philip leaves the revival to talk to one guy, that Ethiopian eunuch, not knowing he is going to touch a whole other continent for the kingdom of God. That man was a Cushite. He was going back to Africa. And the gospel goes to Africa because... the. 
Philip says, hey, I'll be obedient to you. It's not, we, we measure in how many people, in, in, instead of being obedient to the Lord, if we love our neighbor as ourselves, then there's a balance. And it's not an either or thing. If I really devote myself to other people's happiness, then maybe I won't be happy. How many of you come away having done something for someone else and you just get that inner joy and peace? I did the right thing. It's, it's not something that money could buy. I was, I was his hand extended. Boy, I tell you what, it doesn't get better than that. And I love other people as I love myself. Number three, we, le we learn that the first commandment is the compass that guides us to fulfill the second. If you don't love the Lord, you're not going to... Jesus, you know, that's what John writes. He says, how can you say that you love your brother? You don't even love God. But if you love God, you will love your brother. See... Until we realize the fact that, you know, once we received his love, that we can give it away. It's sort of like being at the ocean when you try to dig a hole on the sand. And that wave keeps coming in and fills it up. And we're afraid that if we give something away, that we're not going to have something. God said, let me fill that baby up for you. Let me, by the way, this is not a financial thing. But I have found when I put God first in my finances, he blesses me financially. But he blesses me in stuff that you can't buy. He does some things in my life. He fills me with his presence. He helps me. As I give away, he says, hey, I can give you more blessing. I can do something greater in your life. I can do this because I, I can trust you with my blessing. Amen. But when it's mine, I get to keep my blessing. But when I give it away, it multiplies. It, it does that. See, the first commandment is the basis for the second commandment. The second commandment is the visible expression of the first commandment. If we discover that relationship, there is a fountain that will well up within us of joy that will never be threatened and will never be without the joy of the Lord. We are commanded to love him in all kind of forms and fashions. And all that we are, we want to, to honor him. But it ought to flow out naturally, not contrived. It ought to be something that comes from our heart. It ought to be something, as we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, his attitudes become our attitudes. And the things that motivate him will motivate us. And then we'll be renewed daily. Body, soul, spirit, mind, strength. He'll give us what we need. I am convinced, and this is not in the notes either, but I am convinced that sometimes he doesn't give us more of his spirit because we've not depended on the spirit enough yet to need a refill. We, we've not done what we need to do to, to uh, really prime the pump. But he says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And he wants to do that today. He wants, he wants to fill you with what you need today. Well, what have you done for him? A learning to love like Jesus loves. And it, this loving becomes acts of compassion and mercy and kindness. And it just, it is a natural thing in a believer's life. Bow your heads with me, please. Lord God, we've talked about things to do, but it comes out with who we are first. I pray today that you'd give us the right balance of loving you with all of our heart and our soul and our mind, our strength and everything we have, and the balance of serving and loving others. Forgive us when we love people to the exclusion of our own family. Because that's just as important. To serve you, to love you, to allow you to work in our hearts. This morning, maybe you're here today and you say, I am a follower of Jesus. I, I'm in the process of learning to love like Jesus. And 
I want him to work through me. This message is really not for intended for new converts as far as getting your heart right with God, but you can get your heart right with God. But you know, as a, a servant of God and learning to love like Jesus loves, perhaps there's some areas he's spoken to you this morning about. That would be so individual, but you're saying, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Would you raise your hand and say, I, I just want that applied in my life. I want to learn to love others just like Jesus. I love him. You're saying, that's me today. Putting it in action. Amen. I see your hands. We're, we're just, you're responding to the Lord. This song that Sister Maria is playing is a song of dedication. It says, I, by an act of my will and my mind, intellect, I determine. Now, see, I need the help of the Lord even to do that. It says, I will serve thee because I love thee. All the things you've done in my life, heartaches, broken pieces, all that, you put me back together. Would you stand with me as we sing this chorus, if you want to? I will serve thee because I love you have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken pieces, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary and your touch is what I long for. You have given life. Now let Sister Marie keep playing that. Maybe you just need to come to the altar, seek his face. The longer you stay, the more the ice will melt. Now I'm goofing around, but you know, there are serious times when the Lord is speaking to our hearts. I just want to give you the opportunity to commit and allow God to work in your heart. So if you would like to, we're not going to sing it again, but you can just come and find a place of prayer. Someone will come and pray with you. If you need someone to pray with you, they'll meet you here. Someone will join you. You don't have to come alone. Maybe you can just say to your neighbor, do you want to go? I'll go with you. And that'll be good. But we're just going to let God work in our lives. I want to learn to love like Jesus loves. I want to be who Jesus wants me to be. Heavenly Father, we are thankful today that as we are saved, we are in the process of following you. We thank you for your word that sets the bar very high. Not only do we love you, but we have to learn to love other people. Forgive us when we get short and for, we get cross with people that don't do things the way we think they should be done. Lord God, we're trying our best and we know they're trying their best. Lord, we ask that you would work in our hearts. Help us to serve with all of our heart because when serving them, we're really doing service for you. Your word says, when were you naked or thirsty or unclothed or anything like that? And you say, when you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Lord, help us to have that kind of mindset as we learn to love and serve one another. Work in our hearts, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.